Good night, everyone. I'm about to begin. I'm going to give my lecture on Bedell's incompleteness theorem tonight, which is a cool theorem about mathematics, metamathematics, and self-reference within uh, the system of Principia Mathematica, which is a big book of mathematics that tries to inherently not have self-reference and ends up having self-reference anyway. Um, I'm going to give some historical context to the sort of things that were going around in the early 1900s in the world of mathematics. Uh, there was, this was just kind of the fall of calculus, right, as everyone was kind of figuring things out in calculus. They're just resolving these sets of uh, paradoxes in calculus where the limit of one thing is not equal to the limit of everything. People are like sort of confused about limits a little still. Uh, there's uh, a couple paradoxes that are trying to be resolved. People are a little uncertain of. Uh, there's also this thing going on called Cantor's uh, different types of infinities. And Cantor has used this uh, theory of sets to prove that if there is an infinite object, there is a bigger infinite object, which kind of contradicts what we picture as infinity, right? Infinity is inherently the thing that there's nothing bigger than. And then there is an infinity that is bigger than that. And if there is that infinity, there's one that's bigger than that, and then there's actually an infinite series of infinities. <laughs> and an infinite series of series of infinities, if you will. And there is in fact. <laughs> so um, people are very confused about the state of mathematics. They're kind of going back and saying, wait, I don't think this Cantor guy is right, but they can't figure out anything to prove him wrong. And so they're going to the very fundaments of mathematics and really trying to figure out what the most fundamental axioms are. Um, and so there's this, they, they, they want to ex express what they want uh, mathematically, and that's, they want to express every statement of mathematics so incredibly precisely that no one can possibly be confused as to what exactly you mean. And they want to express the truths that no one can possibly argue with. They want the smallest set of axioms, they're called, which are fundamental truths of mathematics. That which you can that no one could argue with, and they're just obviously true. And then from those axioms, they want to use perfect rules of logic to construct every single statement in mathematics. And so thus perform a proof of any statement that you could want. And so this is kind of what's going on around this time period. And around here, oh, and as for what math should be able to do, this system of math where we start with the axioms and use the logic and continue through and build all these statements of mathematics. We want to precisely state any statement that we want to state, right? We want to know that if it is true, we can prove that it is true, right? If we have a statement like 1 plus 1 equals 2, we should be able to give a formal proof that ends with the line 1 plus 1 equals 2. And if it's false, if we have something like 1 plus 1 equals 3, we want to give a formal proof that ends with the line 1 plus 1 does not equal 3. We want that to be true of our system. And then we also want to make sure that there can't be a way of proving something both true and false. And so if we have a statement 1 plus 1 equals 2 and 1 plus 1 does not equal true, that is a paradox, right? There is no way that that can be resolved in our system. This is both true and false at the same time, which is incredibly confusing for a mathematician. And it might not seem like the hugest deal to have something that's both true and untrue. It might seem like, oh, well, we can just sort of cast these truths and untruths aside. But it turns out that uh, there's a principle in mathematics called the principle of explosion. And what this is, is if you start with two statements, where you have statement x and statement not x, we have this lemon is yellow and this lemon is not yellow, right? We start with those two sentences and we're like, okay, well, we can just maybe ignore lemons for a while. But then we say, well, we construct the statement this lemon is yellow or Santa Claus exists. That has to be true, right? Because the lemon is yellow. So therefore the statement the lemon is yellow or Santa Claus exists is also true logically, right? But then we have another perfectly logical way of saying, well, if the lemon's not yellow, and the lemon is yellow where Santa Claus exists, then clearly Santa Claus exists, right? Because if the first thing is false and the second thing is tr true, then in order for one of them to be true, it's got to be Santa Claus existing. So we've just proved that Santa Claus exists based on the fact that the lemon is yellow and not yellow. Which means that these things in mathematics, if there's like a single sentence that is both true and not true, you can prove anything that you want, which makes the system of mathematics entirely worthless. And so we call these systems inconsistent systems, and it's, it, we really don't want these to happen. Um, so we have this guy come along, his name is Frederick, and he's starting to really formalize set theory and get it down to a, a set of uh, very, very fundamental axioms in this way. And this is around 1907, I believe, and he's two days away 
from publishing his letter, uh, his, his giant paper that's, that's going to say, okay, these are fundamental principles of mathematics, this is how we prove everything, and this is how we're going to go forward from now on. And two days from his publication date, he gets a letter from a guy named Russell, and Russell is going to be very important. Russell, in his letter, says, you know what, I don't know exactly what you're going to say, but you want to think about a certain thing maybe a little more, because I've heard you're about to publish this, and I just want to make sure that you're resolving this paradox. And Frege looks at the, at the letter, and, and he looks, and he, he gets incredibly flustered, and he never ends up publishing his paper, because the paradox that Russell has suggested exists within his theory of set theory. And uh, Russell's paradox is, actually, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get to what Russell's paradox is in a second, but let's start off with what paradoxes are, right? A paradox is a thing that implies truth and untruth at the same time, right? That's what we said before, P and not P. So it has to be both true and not true at the same time. Um, the, the people have been thinking these things for a really long time, and there's this guy named Epitomes. And Epitomes, uh, he thought he was very, very clever, and he just says, oh, well, I am a Cretan. I, I am from Crete, and if I were to say the statement, all creatures are liars, then that would mean that that is a lie, right? Since I'm a Cretan. And so clearly, not all Cretans are liars. And it turns out that this is not technically a paradox, because it could be true that some Cretans are liars, and Epitomes is one of those some Cretans, and so that statement is false. But we can refine it a little more and say something like, this statement is a lie. This is a perfectly valid English sentence that we can construct, but if this statement is a lie, then that means that it's a lie. But if it's a lie, then that means that the fact that it's a lie is a lie, which means it's the truth. And if the fact that it's a lie is a lie means it's the truth, then it has to be the truth, which means it's not a lie. So this is both true and untrue at the same time, or arguably neither true nor untrue. And similarly, we can have a pair of sentences that say, oh, the sentence below is true, and the sentence above is a lie. And, and, and taking these together, you, you think about it for a while and say, okay, well, if the sentence below is true, that means the sentence above is a lie, which means sentence A is a lie which means that sentence B has to be a lie, which means that sentence A has to be true, which means that sentence B has to be true, which, and it goes back and forth and back and forth, and you never actually resolve whether A or B is true or false. It's an, a formally undecidable proposition. And so Russell's paradox attempts to construct this, this same thing in set theory, and this, this is what, what he says in his letters. In, in Frege's system of formalizing sets, you're allowed to have sets that contain themselves. You're allowed to have the set of all sets, for instance, is, is a set which, which pretty obviously contains itself, right? If you have the set of all the sets in the universe, it has to contain the set of all sets, right? Because the set of all sets is a set. Um, you, you call this a self-swallowing set because it's a set that contains itself. Um, but then we have to consider the set of all non-self-swallowing sets, right? We can define a set as non-self-swallowing if it doesn't contain itself. A pretty simple thing to say, and not something that Frege was really considering. And if we consider the set of all non-self-swallowing sets, does it contain itself? Right? If so, then it can't be non-self-swallowing, right? Because it's, by definition, a, a non-self-swallowing set. And, and if, it's, if it's not a non-self-swallowing set, then it can't contain itself, which means it is a non-self-swallowing set. So this is Russell's paradox. And it essentially means you can construct a statement in the system of set theory, which is neither true nor false, and thus you can destroy all the work that Frege has been doing, which is just a one tiny letter. <laughs> um, so, we have to figure out how to fix this, right? Because statements like this aren't unique, it's not just Russell's paradox. There's a bunch of paradoxes that you can make that are sort of like Russell's paradox, but aren't exactly Russell's paradox, and you can't just say, oh, well, we'll ignore Russell's paradox, right? We'll throw out the set of all sets that don't contain themselves. Because you can have statements that interact with each other in really complex ways, and there's no way of guaranteeing that a paradox doesn't exist between multiple sentences. Like we, we saw last time that the sentence below is true and the sentence above is a lie. Those two are perfectly valid sentences, right? If I, if I wanted to say the sentence below is true, that's perfectly fine. That's not a paradox. Likewise, if I wanted to say the sentence above is a lie, that's not a paradox either. It's only when you take them together, their construct becomes this thing that neither of them is alone and makes a paradox. So you could have thousands and thousands and thousands of statements of mathematics that are perfectly fine, but then when you take them all together, you're just like, oh no. 999 statements were fine, but the thousandth one caused this immense paradox, which is ridiculous. So, the way of resolving this is to put statements into a hierarchy. And I, I chose uh, to use a hospital as a metaphor, simply because, well, actually, you'll, you'll see in, in a while why I chose a hospital, but there's this inherent hierarchy to it, where you, you have patients 
who, who have certain diseases, and then, and then you have doctors who talk about hygiene, right? And then you, you, have, you have, say, deans who talk about doctors, and, and perhaps chairmen who talk about deans. And, and these, these people have a fundamental hierarchy set up to them of who is in charge of who. And this, this can go arbitrarily upwards. We, we're only considering the first four <laughs> levels, but it, it, we, we assume it goes on to, to infinity. And so the rule we impose is <coughs> patients can't talk about anyone. Doctors can only talk about patients. They can't talk about other doctors or deans or anyone like that. Deans can only talk about doctors and patients, and chairmen can only talk about deans and doctors and patients, and certainly not Obama. <laughs> Obama on the screen can talk about anything, but maybe there's someone higher up that, that you know, he can't talk about, and he can't talk about himself either. Right? And so we have statements that we make, like the patient has Lyme disease, and so that's, that's a perfectly valid statement, and if, if Cuddy decides to say that Dr. House is lying, then we can look at these statements as a pair and say, okay, Dr. House is lying, Dr. House says the patient has Lyme disease, therefore the patient does not have Lyme disease. There's no paradox inherent in that, sense, in that pairing, right? And if we even go one level further and say Dr. Cuddy also always assesses Dr. House incorrectly, then we have, okay, Cuddy is not assessing him correctly, therefore Dr. House is correct, therefore the patient has Lyme disease. We're perfectly fine, there's no paradox inherent. Uh, similarly, if Dr. House says it's lupus and Cuddy says I'm right, then the chairman says it's never lupus. And no notably, the, the chairman is here currently talking about the dean and the doctor being wrong, and he's also directly talking about the patient. Um, so you can, you can talk about anything in any hierarchy lower than you, but you can't talk about yourself or anything higher than you. And this is you know, the fundamental hierarchy that we, we place upon, upon statements in the hospital. Um, uh, so things that we can't say are things like the doctor is wrong as, as, as a patient, you can't say, I need my kid as a doctor because it's talking about yourself. Right? You, uh, Dean can't say she's always right. Uh, he can't talk about Obama being cut off. He, notably, he can't talk about the slide either because he's contained within the slide. And that would be ridiculous for me to talk about the entire presentation or the, the hierarchy as a whole. And also, everybody lies is, is a statement that you just can't say. So those are all crap. Right? Now, the, what if we have two doctors, right? Is, is, there, is there a way for us to, to form a paradox? So, take any two doctors. Uh, <laughs> if we have Dr. 11 always lies, and Dr. 10 always tells the truth. Well, this, this is just the same pair of paradoxes. This is the sentence below and the sentence above all over again. The question is, which one should we throw out, right? Should we throw out the fact that Dr. 11 always lies, or should we throw out the fact that Dr. 10 always tells the truth? It's kind of tempting to throw away the lying one, right? because you're talking about something being false, but we saw live sentences being perfectly fine on the last slide. And so the, the, this is what, what I have appropriately titled the pair of dots paradox. <laughs> and the, the only solution is to throw out both statements, because they're both talking about doctors, and doctors can't talk about doctors, that's just the way our hospital works. And uh, this, this is an M.C. Escher painting, and it kind of describes what's going on here in a way. If you, if you only look at, say, the, the right half of the painting, and I stand awkwardly in front of the projector, this is a perfectly valid staircase, right? It's just going up along the building. And then if we hop over to the right half of the building and, you know, stand block this side, this, this is also a perfectly valid staircase, though at an incredibly low resolution. I don't know how that happens. Um, and so this staircase going up is fine, and this staircase going up is fine, but it's only together that you say, oh, they're going up and up and up and up and up, and this is completely a paradox. I don't know how this was ever constructed. And so you have a, another situation which is pretty much the same thing, only this guy's a chairman, and so this, the choice is obvious. We can throw out the chairman, or the doctor statement, because he's talking about the hierarchy above him, right? And to show how, how statements can get tangled with each other, if we have 11 doctors, which are all saying each other's lying, you can kind of think about it for a while and say, well, if there's an odd number of doctors, then it can sort of reduce by every pair of doctors, and we have, and whenever you have a circle of an odd number of people saying that they're lying, including a single person saying that themselves are lying, then you have an inherent lie that's going with it, and all of these statements must, must be thrown out, because it causes a paradox. So the conclusion is that in order to avoid paradoxes, we need the systematic hierarchy, where only objects of one level can talk about the objects of the level below them. This is why we can no longer have the set of all sets, right? We can't even have sets of sets. We have to have collections of sets, or, or groups which contain sets and operations, or things like that. We can't have sets of sets anymore. 
Um, so sets can't contain themselves or things of higher order. And statements of mathematics also can't talk about themselves. This is the same thing that was going on with the, the sentences that prove each other false. And if, if you're talking about yourself or something on your own order or something on a higher order, you're going to have the potential to cause a paradox. And again, this, this hierarchy eliminates many valid statements, right? You can, you can say the set of all sets is, is, a, is a pretty good set, but we just can't consider it because we don't want the chance of there ever being a paradox at any point. So this gets rid of a lot of stuff in the hopes of creating a system of mathematics with, without paradoxes. And they, they, they did a very, very precise job of, of trying to eliminate these tangled hierarchies. Uh, so now we're going to try to eliminate some kind of tangled hierarchies in, in English. It's, it's sort of an, an interesting exercise to think about your own language rather than the language of mathematics and, and think of how you could speak in a way where you couldn't say a paradox. So if, for instance, I were to say, in this presentation, I create a version of English designed to eliminate paradoxes, right? Well, what are words that you can't say in there? Does anyone have an idea of, of a word in there that's just like totally bollocks, you can't say it because it might be on the wrong hierarchy, the wrong order? I, I is a great one because I'm talking about myself, right? And I is just like the absolute no-no of, of tangled hierarchies, right? Anything else? This presentation, yeah, that's, that's you guys are doing them in order, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, and any, any other word? There's, there's one more in here, which is, which is a little more subtle. English. English, yeah. Because you can't talk about the language that you're speaking in, right? This is, this is a statement of English, and so it can't talk about the language of English. All right, now, now we have the stricter version of English. It says many perfectly good sentences are meaningless. Well, we have English again, right? And so that's, we definitely can't do that. And then we have the fact that it's talking about perfectly good sentences. And then we have the word meaningless, which is, which is, which is a little subtle, but if you're talking about meaning, meaning is something inherent to the language, and the language is something that's, that's inherently much higher than you, so you can't say meaningless either. And then finally, we're going to call this language stringlish, because it's, it's a stricter version of English. It's a subset of all the words in English that you can say, and you can only say them in this certain way, and it's called stringlish, and it would be tempting to say that the word English is illegal here, right? But it turns out that since the word English is in quotation marks, it's, it's, it's on a level lower, right? It's, it's simply a word. We're not talking about the meaning of English. We're only talking about the characters E-N-G-L-I-S-H. And so this is the quotation of English, if you will. And so we, we have a, a very fundamental thing called a, a, a use and, and a uh, and I mentioned use and mention. These, these are the two things. So a use of the word English is saying you know a stricter version of English, whereas a mention of the word English is simply saying the word English. And so this, this is going to come up several times in the presentation. So anyway, Russell now gets together with a guy named Whitehead, and uh, so they're 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 just going to make a better system of mathematics called Principia Mathematica. And the the goal is to uh, 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 well that's unfortunate. There was totally a quote in there and lots of other stuff, but that, that doesn't really matter. They're, they create a gigantic book with thousands and thousands of pages, just fundamentally uh, proving theorems from, from very basic statements. They have statements of axioms, they have logical rules on which to modify them on, and they do the whole thing with the hopes of not creating a single paradox or, or a single statement that can't be proven. Right? That's, that's really their goal in all of this. And then comes along a guy named Goodell who writes a book called On Formally Undecidable Pro Propositions in Principia Mathematica and Related Systems. And Goodell creates this, this very interesting sentence, uh, and he, he, he says and creates a proof of this fact that to every omega consistent recursive class kappa of formulae their correspond recursive class signs R, such that neither nu generated by R nor neg nu generated by R uh, belongs to FLG of kappa, where nu is the free variable of R. And to be fair, the original was in German, and by the looks on some of your faces, it might as well still be. <laughs> so, uh, Grinnell really created a, a sentence, a, a sentence in the language of Principia Mathematica, just like a mathematical sentence, just like 1 plus 1 equals 0. But instead of saying that 1 plus 1 equals 0, the sentence itself says, G cannot be proven inside Principia Mathematica, and the statement is, is named G. So essentially, what, what it's saying is that I cannot be proven inside of Principia Mathematica. And it seems, it seems that you could all think that this should be an illegal thing, right? 
You're, you can't talk about I inside of Principia Mathematica. They tried so hard to get rid of these tangled hierarchies. It would be ridiculous for one to expect the word I to suddenly come up in, in this formal system that specifically is against I. And it's, it seems like Russell and Whitehead have failed at their task, right? At, at, at proving all these things in mathematics. But it, it turns out that you can further state that in, in any sufficiently powerful system, that you can create a sentence in, inside of that system uh, that states that it can't be proved. So if we have, you know, Principia Mathematica version 2 that suddenly, like, gets rid of all these problems that Cadell described, Cadell also proved that, you know, in that system we can also create another sentence that says I can't be proven inside this new formal system, Principia Mathematica part 2. And so, in any formal system, you have this sentence, I can't be proven which is a pretty powerful concept. We now have the fact that provability is less than truth, right? There's a sentence that can never be proved that's constructed inside of Principia Mathematica. So this means, I mean, to, to, to give away a little bit of the ending, this means that mathematics is infinite, right? We are going on, on a task and we have proven that there is no end, right? That everything, all the statements we can make there is no statement, there are some statements we can make that can just never be proven. And so mathematics is an infinite pursuit, and we're just, we're just going along and it will be forever. Or perhaps it will be inconsistent and everything will blow up. Those are the only two options. Either we're incomplete or we're inconsistent. Which is, which is a pretty cool idea. So now, now we're going to delve a little bit into Principia Mathematica and see what kind of statements we can make. Uh, so, uh, informally describing things, uh, Principia Mathematica can pretty easily state and prove things like 5 is not prime, or things like 2 is not a square, or 1729 is the sum of two cubes. It's actually the smallest sum of two cubes that can be a sum of two cubes in two ways, which can also be proven. And no sum of positive cubes is itself a cube. That's a thing that can be proven. There are infinitely many prime numbers. That's, that's a wonderful thing that can be proven. Uh, Fermat's last theorem can be proven. The fact that 6 is even can be proven, which is probably should go at the top rather than the bottom, as it's a little less significant than Fermat's last theorem. Um, but we want to state these more formally, right? Because that's, that's not a very strict way of, of describing those statements, and may, might allow for some tangled hierarchies to go on. So instead of saying 5 is prime, what if we say there do not exist numbers, both greater than 1, such that 5 equals a times b? That's, that, that's a good way of describing that, that 5 is prime, right? If, if we have two numbers, a and B that multiply to 5, then 5 is clearly not prime, because A times B equals 5. And so we can, we can prove the primeness of any number in this way. And similarly, 2 is not a square. We want to say there does not exist a number B such that B times B equals 2. 1729 is the two, sum of two cubes is, is pretty straightforward. There do not exist numbers B and C such that B times B times B plus C times D times T equals 1729. And so we, we've sort of taken this, these abstract statements like prime and cube and square and broken them down into things like addition and multiplication and existence. Uh, we, we further have, uh, you know, instead of posit sum of positive cubes is itself a cube, then we say, you know, if, if there's any two numbers that sum to be a, a cube, then you, you can't make a cube if that's number. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through and describe these very uh, explicitly because we are probably going to run out of time at some point. So, you can see from these statements, though, that there's these fundamental elements that we really, really need when we're trying to formally describe statements of mathematics. So you can, you can see that for, for most of these statements, we have, like, for all numbers, it holds true that, right? For all integers, right? This, this is, this is, we're only talking about integers here because that's where mathematics is, is funded on. There's, there's no, there's no, founded on, sorry, that's a little different. There's, there's no, like, uh, construction of the rationals that doesn't depend on the integers, right, or real numbers. We're, we're starting at the integers and we're going out from there. So first we need to know things about integers. So we have for all numbers a, it holds true that. We have for there exists a number a such that. Uh, that's sort of the same kind of level of thing. Uh, then we have greater than or equals, then we have times and plus, and then we have the numbers at the bottom. And you can see how these sort of fall into an inherent hierarchy, right? We have numbers at the very bottom. The numbers can't really do anything at all. They, they, they just simply sit there and they are what they are. And then we have certain modifications of numbers, right? Like times and plus, and so we combine two numbers together and make another number, which is a pretty cool off function. And then, once we have all these combinations of times and plus and equals and things like that, then we can compare them to each other, right? We can use an equal sign to say one plus one equals two, right? And so we can 
this, is, this becomes a statement. This becomes something that can be proven, true or false. And then even higher than that, we can say, oh, this can be true, this can be proven true for a lot of things, right? This can be proven true for all things, or this can be proven true for one thing. And so these kind of statements are things that we can construct out of these basic elements, all sort of in their hierarchy. So we don't like to construct things with using too many symbols. So in principia mathematica there, they use, uh, well, in, in a system called Pino arithmetic, which is equivalent to Principia Mathematica, but a little easier to comprehend. Uh, so we have zero represented by zero, logically enough. Uh, one is the successor of zero, uh, rather than being just one. This, uh, and then two is the successor of one, and uh, if you just have the operation successor by itself, it doesn't actually make sense. It's not a valid string of Principia Mathematica, if you will. And so then we have A, B, C, D, and E, all variables, in the sense that you might think of them, and you, you have higher levels that can, that can talk about these numbers. And A prime, B prime, we want to have an, an infinite number of variables. So we just, we just add primes at the end to, to, to keep us down in our number of letters that we use. Um, a number plus another number is a number. This is pretty obvious stuff. Another times another number is another number. The, the only real thing to note here is that when you have A plus B, plus three, like you, you need to keep the parentheses first of all, because plus is only a binary operation. You can only take two things and add them together. And the other thing is that a plus b is a number, and it needs to be a number to be added to another number. We can't have a statement plus a statement, or things, things like that. Uh, then, then we have the notion of equality, where we have a statement number equals number, uh, and so this is, these are things like zero equals zero and one equals zero, and you can add a tilde at the beginning to a statement to say it is not the case that this, and so we have, it is not the case that zero equals zero, that is obviously false because zero does equal zero. Um, and these statements can be either fully quantified or contain free variables. Uh, a fully quantified statement is a statement like zero equals zero, which doesn't have free variables. An unquantified statement is this, like a is two plus b. Uh, we don't know whether that's true or not, right? You can't just like say, oh, a is never two plus b, or you can't say a is always two plus b. It's, uh, we don't know what it is until we know what a and b are. Uh, so that's not a fully quantified thing. It has two free variables, we say. And so, so some pretty obvious statements we can make so far is the fact that 0 equals 0, the fact that 1 equals 0, the fact that 1 is not 0, the fact that a is 5, the fact that a is not 5, the fact that 1 plus 1 is 2, and the fact that a is twice b. So we can, we can construct all these statements pretty, pretty simply out of Principia Mathematica. Note at this point that we can't prove any of these things true yet. We're just, we're just constructing things that we can say, and things that we can say in a way that is incredibly clear and cannot ever be argued with. Then we have and and or. And and, and or take two statements, and if, if the statements together are, are both true, then and will say, oh, then the collection of A and B, if A and B are both true, is itself true. And similarly, or, it takes two statements and gives out a statement, and if either A or B is true, then A or B is true. Uh, and Note that that's not exclusive or. If A is true and B is true, then if A or B is true. Uh, yeah. And then we have our, our friends, there exists and it is true for all, which are the upside down A and the upside down E, which are really fun to write when you're writing out proofs. <laughs> and uh, when you say there exists an A, such that A has this property, uh, you, you, you're, you're really saying, you know, there, there exists an A. And, uh, you, one thing to note here is that I put a star next to a statement uh, when it has a free variable in it, and I'll, I'll put two stars when it has two free variables. This is just a syntactic thing to keep track of whether statements are fully quantified, whether they have a true or false value, or whether it's just a property of some numbers. All right, so we have there exists an A such that A plus one equals two. That's true because you know A can be one, and that's pretty simple. Or there exists an A, a B such that B times two is three. That's false because b has to be an integer. We're only considering integers, so there, there really doesn't exist anything that can, we can multiply by 2 and make it 3. Um, or we can say there exists a b such that b times 2 equals a, and that's a statement about a, right? That's basically saying that a is even because there exists a b such that b times 2 is a. And we know that b is an integer, so if a is an even number, we can prove it true, and if it is an odd number, we can prove it false. Um, and, and then finally, we can say there does exist an A that is even, which is essentially adding there exists an A to the previous statement. Um, very similarly, we have the concept of for all A. Uh, a has this property. Um, that's just an upside down A. And as you can see, it's not true for all uh, A that A is even, right? 
but it, it is true for all A that A has a number that's one bigger than it, right? We couldn't say it's true for all A that A has a number that's one less than it, because A could be zero, and we don't have negative numbers yet. Um, so yeah, these, these are kind of redundant at this point, but we have, we have the fact that A is even is something that we can say. We have the fact that A is greater than B that we can say. We have the fact that A is prime. This is a little interesting one, but oops. Okay. And I don't have a mouse. <laughs> Touch pad. This is, no, I don't have, like, it's not responding. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Okay. Well. F5 and the arrow keys working? F5 is not working. Did your computer find a paradox? I think oh. it did. <laughs> <laughs> well then. All right, so we, we, have, we have certain kinds of statements that we're, we're able to, to say in a sentence. So can you all tab it over to the other one, though? I can. So we can, we can say things like A is prime, because that's just saying, oh, there's no B and C uh, such that B times C equals A. That's similar to how we were proving 5 is prime before. Uh, we can say there exists something that's both even and prime by just saying there exists an A such that A is even and A is prime. And we can say there are an infinite number of primes. This is a pretty cool statement, statement because we can say it's true for any number, that there exists a number bigger than it that's also prime. So this is, this is kind of compounding our statements that we've developed together into a much greater sentence. And then we have that A and B commute together under addition. And then we can have all numbers can be expressed as the sum of four squares. These, these happen to all be true things and, and pretty cool things at that that you can prove in the system of particular mathematics. So how do we prove these things? This, this is a little more complicated because we need a set of things that are inarguably true, right? These are things like zero equals zero, and then we need a small set of rules of just logical things. Things like De Morgan's law, or the, the fact that if, if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. These are, these are like very fundamental logical rules, and to be honest, I'm not going to go into them because they're not very enlightening, and at the end of the day, this has to be provable for all systems, right? Not just Principia Mathematica. This has to be provable in general. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of how Principia Mathematica is, is constructed. It's a cool thing to look into if you want to ask me about it afterward, but I'm not going to go too much into it tonight. I am going to give a, a meta, meta, oh, okay. Well, we can talk about Gwynell over here first. Uh, it's, it's very notable to state that given our system of constructing things, we can represent every single uh, statement with a number. This is, a, this is a, a pretty cool thing. So if we wanted to say 0 equals 0, we could write out you know, the, the characters 0 equals and 0 and, and end up with that. But we could also use a system of translation. right? And we could say 0 equals 0 is actually just 666 equals is... I, I wish I could. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we need. Do we... Yeah, Brazil. All right. How's that? Zero equals zero. Pretty cool thing. All right. Six six six. One one one. Six six six. Now this is actually the number six hundred sixty-six million one hundred one hundred eleven thousand six hundred sixty-six. That's actually what this represents. And if we, if we wanted to, we could represent it in the system as s s s s s. <laughs> 666 million of these all the way down to zero, right? So this, this is just a number. And this, again, is, uh, is sort of mentioning this statement that zero equals zero, right? We, we, have, we have the number 666666, sorry. We have the number 6661166. And that number is the mentioning of this statement that zero equals zero. We have a system of translating back and forth between one of them. And this is just a really cool thing to know about the streams of Principia Mathematica. And in fact, in any formal system that, that's you know, sufficiently powerful, we can, we can choose this way of deciding things. All right, so um, in, instead of giving you the axioms of Principia Mathematica, uh, we're, we're going to deal with a slightly different system just to see how these things can be constructed. Uh, so we, we start out with, the, this is called the PQ system. Uh, and, and what 
Oh, so so that, that first thing is actually false. Uh, <laughs> we, we, can, uh, we, we start with our axioms of PQ system, and the first one is PQ, not PQ hyphen. Um, and so this is something that we just say is God-given. This is, this is absolutely true. This is our axiom. Right? And then we have our rules of descending things. And we say, if x, y, and z are strings of hyphens, then the x, p, y, q, z is a true thing. Then we can also add a hyphen to the end of x and add a hyphen to the end of z and get a true string. And then we could also add a hyphen to the end of y and hyphen to the end of z and also get a true string. So these are just ways of starting with pq, which is really just zero hyphens, p, zero hyphens, q, and then zero hyphens again. And then we can start to play around with this. We can go, oh, well, hyphen p q hyphen is a string, right? Because we just added one to the beginning and end. And we can go hyphen p hyphen q hyphen hyphen, right? That's a I don't, I don't know why this is happening, but thank you, Cedar. Um, and so we have we have this statement, and then we can you know can continue on you know and we could maybe we can do another step here and and add it now one two three and we we can continue on manipulating our string with with either one of these two rules on and on and on until we get and now. It might be evident to some of you at this point that this is just a way of writing out addition, right? We can look at these strings as, you know, hyphen pq hyphen, or we could just say 1 plus 0 equals 1, where p represents plus and q represents equals. And similarly, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and 1 plus 2 equals 3. 1 plus 3, that's not 4. I promise it's not 4 equals 4. <laughs> All right, so we, we just started with an axiom that's, that's God-given and somehow inarguably true. We started with these really arbitrary rules, and now we've been creating strings of things as, as theorems, right? And so these don't inherently have meaning, right, in, in the universe. We've just kind of arbitrarily decided that these rules are correct and these things are correct, and if, if there were some universe where PQ were fundamentally true in, in this meaning, and you know, if, if we take the addition thing, then 0 plus 0 equals 0 is something that's pretty fundamentally true, right? Um, then, then we can continue with these axioms, and we can actually construct any addition problem that we want, right? There's, there's, there's a formal way of constructing these addition problems by saying, oh, if I want to say that 4 plus 5 equals 9, then I just have to apply the first rule four times, and the second rule five times, and I'll, I'll get you know, 4 plus 5 equals 9. And if I want to say 4 plus 5 equals 10, then I apply the rules and I find, oh, wait, 4 plus 5 doesn't equal 10. Right? And I, I can do that by proving that 4 plus 5 equals 9 in this, in this specific system. Right? But it's, it's, it's an interesting exercise in, in trying to construct things, because in, in this, we only have statements that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's like this, this fundamental way of, of constructing them. In Principia Mathematica, it's not true this way. We have, we have a bunch of weird statements that are like, well, you can take two statements and collapse them into a single statement that means you know, this thing follows from these two premises, and there's ways of constructing a way of constructing things from premises. And so it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but it, it boils down to something similar to this, in that we have an axiom, we have rules that we can apply to the axioms, and we can change them into these strings that ultimately have meaning to us, right? We have this string that can mean something like 5 is prime. And it's, it's, all, all it is is a construction from different axioms, but it, it's, it's something that, that has a little more valuable meaning to us because of the way we choose to interpret it. Um, so this, this system can uh, do true additions, right? The, the, that's all it's capable of doing, not, not much else. I can't say anything about prime numbers. I certainly can't say anything about, about and, and anything about itself, right? It's, it's not sufficiently powerful to do that. But um, Principia Mathematica is capable of producing what are called primitive recursive statements. And so this is something that uh, is, is more of a programming term than, than anything else. Uh, when we have uh, a, anything which can be expressed in a finite number of computations, 
we can describe as primitive recursive. Right? Anything where we can say do this, 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 and end, right? that is a primitive recursive program. So no, note that we, we're, we're testing the primality in this function here. Uh, so we, we start out with uh, start out with res equals false. I'm, I'm working in MATLAB here. I'm uh, terribly sorry for working in MATLAB, but I figured there might be freshmen here who don't know other languages. Um, we start out with the result equals false. MATLAB doesn't have a false, so we use zero. Uh, we can, and then we iterate through one through n. We iterate through one through n and j, and if i times j equals n. So if we're testing five, we go one times one is not five. One times two is not five. One times three is not five. And eventually we go, you know, three times one, three times three, all the way through all the combinations up to five. Note that we probably could have made these caps a little lower, right? We could have only gone to half of five or, or something like that. Yes? Given that you're looping from one to n. You are you correct. One to n. We loop two to n. That's what we should be doing. Yeah. So uh, this, this would actually give the wrong answer. Uh, I don't have MATLAB installed on my computer right now. So I didn't actually test this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so th this is a program that tests whether a number is prime, just like the statement of, of Principia Mathematica tests whether a thing is prime. So this must be expressible in Principia Mathematica because it's expressible in a finite number of computations. There's, it's, it's a long, very complicated proof expressing why these things are actually equivalent to each other. But one can sort of instinctually know that, OK, if I can say in a finite number of steps, whether this thing is, is provable, then I can make a finite string about it that, that says, you know, well, one times one is not prime, and two times two is not prime, etc., etc., etc. It's a really long string, but it's finite, right? Um, note, however, that these caps have to be finite. If, if n were something like infinity, this, this program would never terminate, and it wouldn't be primitive recursive. Um, if, we, if we want something that's guaranteed to terminate, uh, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to prove which, which MATLAB programs are, are tough. Uh, so, I, yeah. Um, and this is, this is called the halting problem, which is essentially a problem that, that, that many beginning programmers have, where they're staring at the computer screen going, OK, so is this program just taking a really long time, or did I accidentally put it in an infinite loop? And it's not necessarily an easy thing to figure out. I mean, when, once you learn to write your code well, it's easy to go through, OK, here, 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 OK. It's definitely not in an infinite loop. Um, but in, in general, for a program that's you know kind of kind of sloppily written and just a random collection of symbols, the halting problem is very very difficult to solve, and it is in fact impossible to solve in the general case. And, and one, one one can prove things like this, which is interesting. So, in order to make a language, any programming language, primitive recursive, we have to do something that's a, a, a little hard to do, and it's it's the same thing that was hard to do for Principia Mathematica. We have to throw out a lot of really good programs. And by doing this, we have to take, make these two stipulations. We have to say there can't be any while loops, because while loops aren't guaranteed to terminate, right? And we, can't, we have to say that there's no reading to or writing, uh, reading from or writing to files, because files are something outside the system, right? And if we, if we, there's a pretty easy way of creating an infinite loop by just saying, OK, this program is saved as A, read from file A. And then that just goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So that's an easy way to make an infinite loop, and it's something that we don't necessarily want to do. Um, similarly, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but recursive programs, uh, such, such as uh, program A that, that calls itself, we can't have recursive things uh, in, in this very strict version of MATLAB because it's, it would be uh, very easy to create an infinite loop. Right? A program that calls itself it is going to end up in an infinite loop very easily. And so by making these rigorous stipulations, we, we have rigorous MATLAB, or, or RATLAB, and uh, th these, these programs can be made such that they're, they're primitive recursive, and they will, in theory, always be primitive recursive. Right? Um, and so these languages that we've created here, there's, there's RATLAB, there's Stringlish, and there's Principia Mathematica, this, this Pino arithmetic system that we have. If you, if you notice, they've been color coordinated the whole time. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so they, these are all equivalent languages. They're capable of saying the same statements. So if, if, we, if we have a proof of, of you know, the existence of a thing like I in, in MATLAB or, or Stringlish or, or Principia Mathematica, then we have it in all of the others, because the, these languages have, have proven to be equivalent. Um, so you know, now we have to think really hard about what programs are primitive recursive. Right? We have, Something like the factorial of n would probably be primitive recursive, right? You just iterate through, okay, if I want to find 4 factorial, I just take 4, 2 times 1, we're done. 
right? If we want to find uh, the nth digit of pi, this is an interesting one, right? Because pi is an irrational number, right? But we can approximate pi. We can say, oh, if I want to go down to a pi that's at least 10 digits long, right, and is accurate to at least 10 digits, then I can, I can have this series that approaches pi and will be definitely within 0. 0.000001 after a certain number of iterations. And so we can put a cap on the number of inter iterations and do it with a for loop instead of a while loop. So this is actually another thing that's primitive recursive. Um, the remainder between n and m, m divided by n, all we have to do is take m subtract out n and uh, just do that until we get a remainder, right? And so the remainder between 24 and 7 is 3. Now this is an interesting one. If, if something is a well-formed string of this PQ system, right? If we, if we take PQ system and say, okay, what if P represents, or P is to four by the number six, Q is to four by the number nine, and hyphen is represented by the number seven. Well, then we can take any, any one of these strings and say, okay, well, this will equal seven, six, nine, seven, right? The number seven, six, nine, seven. And then can we take that number, put it into a program and say, well, is this a correctly formatted number of PQ? Um, it's, it's, it's something worth noting at this point that if I have a, a silly string of the PQ system that you know, says an incorrect statement, uh, some, something like four plus, oh shit, that's correct. <laughs> How did I do that? All right, something like four plus zero equals five, um, then it's still well formed, right? It's something that should be provable either true or false. So this is a well-formed statement. Um, and then, if we, if, but if we had something like P, P, Q hyphen, that doesn't make any sense the way we've defined our system. So it can't be a well-formed string. So in primitive recursive program, all it has to do is you know, divide this number by 10 and see what the difference is between it and its, or divide the number by, take its remainder with 10, right? That's the last digit, right? Then divide it by 10. Then take that remainder when it's divided by 10, that's the next digit, right? So you can, you can get out a string of digits 7, 7, 7, 9, 7, 7, 7, 6, going, going backwards, right? You can flip that list around and say, oh, am I of the form a bunch of hyphens P, bunch of hyphens Q, bunch of hyphens? And that program could very easily say yes, or it could very easily say no, right? Now we have the notion of creating a proof pair and, and this is something where you take a string, you take the rule of iteration that you apply to it, call them rules one and rules two, um, then you have another string, and then you take the next rule of iteration and apply that. And so we, we have this, this very long number, this 691679727767977, which is not a very meaningful number unless you look at it as a proof pair. Well, we start with 6-9, which is our fundamental axiom, and our program can check, oh yeah, the fundamental axiom equals 6-9. Check, we're true. And then it can say, oh, the next digit is 1. So I want to see if the next string of digits equals what I think 6-9 should be when I apply axiom 1 to it, or rule of iteration 1. And so then we have 6 7, 9, 7, 7 this idea that 0 plus 1 equals 1. And then we apply 2. And then we figure out that, well, by rule two, we get the statement that one plus one equals two. And thus I have verified this first number, one plus one equals two. So I, I have created a proposition, does one plus one equal two? And then I provided a proof of it. Well, because of these things, one plus one equals two. And so I've done this all just with numbers. And so I can pass numbers into these primitive recursive programs. And we're, we're, we're starting to see a little bit of how the system can sort of talk about itself. Because something that was originally just a number has, has now been interpreted in a way that's on a level much higher than it originally was. And we're starting to see that maybe Principia Mathematica can say things that are a little bit higher on the hierarchy level. And so uh, we, we don't really, we don't have our system of translation uh, yet, but when we have uh, these Principia Mathematica uh, proof pairs, we use the same format as before, right? We're trying to prove this uh, 999, uh, which is the tilde, right? 666, six, six, which is the zero, 111, one, one, which is equals, and 666, six, six, which is zero again. So it is not the case that zero equals zero. And then 
Well, this is, this is certainly not about truth fair because this is not this is not a valid statement, and I, I, I apologize for that. But um, if we if we were to take that number and then start start with the fundamental axiom, zero equals zero, apply some rule of iteration, call it zero zero two, and then we we end up with the case that that uh, it is not the case that what I think I was trying to say is not the case that the successor of zero equals zero. This, this is one of the, the valid rules of iteration, right? If, if a number equals another number, then the successor of that number can't equal that number. That's one of these things that we argue is logically just so fundamental. Um, and so zero has no successor. Uh, and so we could use that rule of iteration, and then we would have just a big long number that says it is not the case that one equals zero, and we would have an even bigger long number that says, okay, this is a proof that it's not the case that one equals zero. And so now we're starting to get a lot of self-reference, right? Because, because we're inside the system of Principia Mathematica. So we're gonna, we're gonna go back to English because we've, we've been in mathematics for entirely too long. And we're, we're, going, we're going to talk about self-reference and how, how explicitly we could be. I mean, we wanna, we wanna try to make a sentence that is, that is both true and, and false at the same time. We wanna try to make a sentence that says this sentence is false. By, by using these quotations, which we've just developed in, in Principia Mathematica. And so we can try by saying, oh, well, the sentence, the sentence is false is false. And then we think about, well, that's sort of self-referential, right? Because the sentence is false is contained within the sentence, but it's not the entire sentence, right? So we, we, we're talking, we're still on these levels of hierarchy. We say the sentence, the sentence is false is false, but we're still one level out from the sentence is false. And then we have this, well, well, then we want to say the sentence, the sentence, we, we want to try to stick that sentence into itself. And we want to try to stick that sentence into itself again and again and again and again. And we end up with this infinitely long sentence, right? The sentence, the sentence, the sentence, the sentence, the sentence, the sentence, the sentence. And then we, we say that it's infinitely long. And, and yes, that's, that's true that it's infinitely long, but it certainly couldn't be constructed in strict English because it's an infinitely long sentence and such things are silly. Uh, <laughs> So these, these fail to be self-referential. Um, so if we want to have a sentence talk about itself, we want to actually make its quotation. So if, if the one fundamental thing that we can talk about is a quine, which is a statement which represents its own repetition. Like if I want you to say this sentence back to me. So ideally, I'd want to do the same thing that I was doing before. I want to say, you know, say this back to me. But I, I don't have the say part, right? I don't have the quote smart. So what I actually have to say is say followed by its quotation, say, followed by its quotation. And then you would say back to me, say, followed by its quotation, say, followed by its quotation. And you have just repeated this thing back to me, which is, which is a pretty cool thing, right? Because now we have a sentence which is legitimately like talking about itself. And we have, like, you would, you would say back to me, say, followed by its quotation. And uh, a program that can talk about itself, I don't, I don't actually have here because I left it in the wrong place, and I don't have MATLAB, and I couldn't construct it again, which is which is so unfortunate. Um, but essentially, what you would do to write a program that outputs itself, um, this is quines are cool things. If you want to look them up, there's tons and tons of quines uh, out there in the universe. Uh, there's uh, there's programs that output themselves in every single language. There's programs that output themselves in a different language that, when interpreted in that language, can be interpreted back in the original language as itself. <laughs> And there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's strings of, you know, eight or nine of these, and there's, there's, there's a Ruby program that I saw that, that outputs itself uh, with the, a picture of the world inside of the code, if you, like, actually look at it, and then it outputs another version of itself with the world rotated by a certain number of degrees. And so if you have, like, 45 degrees, it'll output itself, like, eight times, and on the eighth time, it'll be itself again, which is the craziest thing. <laughs> But anyway, if, if, I, if, I want, if I want to make a uh, quine in, in this, this language, which I have rather silly titled RATLAB, uh, and I make uh, RATLAB quine, uh, doesn't really need any inputs because all it's doing is outputting itself. Uh, this, this is just going to be a sketch of the function. Uh, but essentially what we want to do is have something that says how to quote a function, um, which uh, is, is going to be a subfunction in there, which says, this is what I mean by quotation. So if, if we go back to when, when I said, say, followed by its quotation, say, followed by its quotation, well, what do I mean by a quotation? And essentially, what, what I mean by a quotation is, uh, well, when, when MATLAB interprets strings, 
it, it interprets this, right, uh, in the middle of a string. Like if I were to say a l apostrophe s, if this was a string, it would output a l apostrophe s. This is a useful thing to know about that. All you have to do is put double quotes in there, and it'll it will interpret this as a single quote, rather than like accidentally breaking out of the string because you have a single quote inside of there. Um, so all all this function has to do is uh, in order to quote itself, you have to take uh, any, any, any string, this is just an example of this function working, a l s would go to a l double s. All it's doing is iterating through the characters and uh, replacing them with double quotes whenever necessary. And so all this does is define what we mean by a quotation here. And then when we do that, then we say uh, string one equals all of these words. I just copy them in, all that. String two equals all of these words that we're about to write. Copy them in. And from there, we display, well, string one, which is the beginning, right? Uh, no notably, these, these do not include the, the uh, assignment statements, because if we did, we would have an infinite loop again, like this is say the thing where you say the thing where you say the thing, and you, you like keep quoting this over and over and over again. So it can't include itself. But we can say, well, say string one, and then say str1 equals, and then quoted of string one. And then str2 equals, and then quoted of str2. Uh, this, is, this is essentially saying this middle part, the string one equals this, string two equals this. Notice how we're saying these twice, uh, string one and string two, but just references to them, uh, which, is, which is again the display, or the, the use mentioned duality that we have here. Um, uh, for it, actually, of string two. And then finally, we actually have put string two, which is everything we have here. <coughs> and then we end. And it turns out that this program actually outputs itself, and it does it without reading the file, which is, which is kind of a crazy thing. And it's, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around, around a program like this, because it's structured so strangely. Um, but it, it's, it's an interesting exercise to try to make one of these yourself. Uh, and try to think of all the things that you need to do to not bury yourself in a tangled hierarchy. Um, you have to think of what you need to say. Well, I need to say the beginning of the program. Then I need to say the things where I talk about the program. And then I need to say the end of the program. And so this, there's these kind of use mentioned dualities that bang around inside every, everywhere. Uh, but this is the kind of program that you end up with. And it's totally possible for a program to talk about itself and, in fact, display itself. Now we want to say, when a sentence proves itself false. This is, this is getting pretty deep into uh, what, what, what uh, Goodell's theorem is about. Right? We, we want a sentence which proves its own unexistence. And so in strict English, all we have to do is say the equivalent of this sentence is false without saying the words this sentence. And we can do that with the following words. We say, quote, yields falsehood when preceded by its quotation, unquote. Yields falsehood when preceded by its quotation. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very clever thing that not, not a lot of people thought about for many, many years. And then when someone discovered it, it was just like, oh, well, we can, we can do this. And, it's, it's, and so you think about the sentence, well, yes, if, if you took that thing and then preceded it by its quotation, then you're talking about yourself, right? You're both using and mentioning yourself in order to talk about yourself. Um, and so this, this is a false sentence, right? Uh, what, what, how can a program disprove itself? This is, this is a weirder thing, right? Because programs don't have a notion of proof. But we know that this program exists in the language of, math, of RATLAB, right? And so in order to prove that it's false, we have to say, well, this program is non-terminating. We need to make a non-terminating program without using a thing like a wide loop, without using recursion, without using a thing for you to read from yourself. And in fact, it's, it's this exact same program, only instead of <coughs> display, you use the command eval. Eval takes a string and evaluates the program, right? Meaning that it runs the program. 
Meaning that if you can mention yourself, you can also use yourself with this with this evaluate command. And it's 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 a complicated command, uh, admittedly. Like it, it seems a little unfair to be able to use this inside of Bratlab, but it turns out that you can really construct all the things that MATLAB needs to do out of these primitive recursive notations. So it's totally a legal thing to use the about command. Um, so when we run this program, it creates itself, right? And then it runs itself. And then it creates itself again, because that program is creating itself. And then it runs itself. And so we end up in this infinite loop. And that's why we have a program that disproves its own existence, right? It's supposed to not be able to terminate, but it actually terminates. And now, we want to be able to do this in math. <coughs> and I will apologize on my part because I had the full proof of this written up, and then I stuck it on a flash drive, and I stuck that flash drive on a computer, and I gave that computer to IT, and that flash drive no longer exists. And so I, I, got, I got most of this slideshow recreated. Uh, you can see it was kind of sketchy at the end, but I, I certainly don't have this very last slide, which is the, the last slide that we, that we really need, is the proof of Goodell's theorem. But um, <laughs> to, to, to sketch it out, we, we know that we can create this notion of A can be proved inside uh, Principia Mathematica as, as a program, right? Which means that we can create the uh, Principia Mathematica statement that A can be proven, right? Uh, we, all, all we have to say is it's true for some B that there exists a proof pair, A proved by B, right? And then the, that's fundamental idea number one. Fundamental idea number two is the substitution program, uh, which all it does is take a statement, it's a Goodell number, right? Uh, you can't actually put things that aren't numbers into programs, but if, if we take the Goodell number of this step, statement and say, okay, if I want to say b equals b times b, and I want to substitute 4 into that, this is the statement 4 equals 4 times 4. And that's, that's what the substitution program does. Um, now, if we, if we want to make a sentence that actually disproves itself, um, we have to make a substitution program that substitutes itself into itself, which is a lovely little thing, which is actually equivalent to what we just did here, as far as substituting itself into itself. And so the, the kind of the kind of thing that we say is sub uh, sub uh, maybe where where sub sub of a and b all we're doing is substituting into sentence a sentence a and then seeing if that results in b. So here we have uh, a, a substituted into 4 uh, equals b, right? And now instead of substituting in 4, we substitute in this, this a, right? And so we, we substitute its own Goodell number into itself. And, and it, it turns out um, that if you have the statement uh, via proof, uh, proof pair, there exists a B that proves A. All right, so we still have A uh, unqualified. And um, we, 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 can, we have sub sub A and B. Then what we totally have is, um, it's not easy to see. And in, in fact, it's incredibly difficult to see. But if you were to take this sentence and substitute it into itself, it is the equivalent of saying this whole sentence is false. Um, I'm not going to describe exactly why that is right now. Um, but it, it, it's essentially, it is the fact that there has to be a sub, there has to exist a b where a can be substituted into b. But there doesn't have to exist a proof pair of A and B. Um, and so because there has to exist this, then we've proved that this or this, I'm sorry, this, is, this should be an or, uh, that, that we proved that this one is true. Uh, this, this, this one is false. Yes, there should be a false there. OK. I really wish I had constructed it uh, for, for all of you tonight. And I, I apologize for not doing that. But 
this, this is essentially what we have. Uh, this is the sentence, uh, if, if we label it G, this is the sentence G is not provable. And that means that I am not provable, right? Because this is the sentence G. And so this sentence substituted into itself disproves its own existence. Uh, which is just the, the craziest concept. Uh, so it, we, we now have programs which can have this concept of I. And there, there, there are people who are argue that this, this disproves the, the possibility of, of artificial intelligence. These, these are people who are probably long dead. But they, they, <laughs> they, they thought that this, this was the end of the argument that we could have artificial intelligence. Because a human can look at this and say, this sentence means that G is not provable. Therefore, this sentence must be true. right? Because if it were false, uh, if, if it's false that G is not provable, then G is provable, but G is false, right? Which means that we have inconsistency. Uh, inconsistency means that you know, this, this is true, this is provable, but it's not true, right? Which, which is inconsistency. The other thing that we can have is incompleteness, which is G is not provable, where there, where there are some things that just can't be provable. Uh, so a human can look at this and go, oh, well, obviously this sentence is true. But a machine can never do that. And there are, there are people who would vehemently argue that this, I, actually there, there is still a guy who vehemently argues that this, that, that this disproves artificial intelligence forever. Because you know, there's just something that humans can do that robots can't do. But for, for me personally, this, this is something that proves that artificial intelligence might be possible. Because this is the concept of I, right? This is very fundamentally that G is not provable. That means that, you know, it's, it's like saying, I do not exist, right? And if we were to take this sentence and get rid of the negation, this is the sentence, G is provable, which is not a paradox, but is incredibly interesting, right? Because we have this idea that I exist, which has been constructed in the formal language of Principia Mathematica. And because the formal language of Principia Mathematica is equivalent to all these other programming languages that we exist, they're all Turing complete, they're all equivalent to each other, which means that they all together these, they can all create this concept of I within them. And so it means that there is this possibility of, of things which can sort of think about themselves, things which can create parts of themselves. And so because of this way of breaking the tangled hierarchy that we have in turning to play languages, we have this way of, of, of talking about I. And I, I, I think this, this thing, this, this makes artificial intelligence even more exciting. Things like Goodell's incompleteness theorem. And, uh, I apologize for not having the complete proof here, uh, but this, that, that was my talk. I hope you all enjoyed it.